Well, I'm pretty excited to be here in Montana to tell you that I don't know very much. <laughs> when I graduated from Ag College about 45 years ago now or something like that, there wasn't much I didn't know, and his life has taken me along the way. <laughs> I now freely admit that I know very little. So with that uh, caveat as to my academic credentials, plus I'm outstanding in my field and I'm of Norwegian ancestry, and you know about Norwegians, you can, you can always tell a Norwegian, you just can't tell them much. <laughs> so take all that into account with what I'm going to share with you today. So I uh, even asked me to come down here and, and share some of the things that I do, and probably more importantly, why I do them. And so I'm just going to go through a little a few pictures here of some of the the things that happen on, on Naomi and my farm. And, uh, and if there's any questions along the way, Eamon says we have a little bit of time, so if you, if you don't understand my accent or whatever, please, please feel free to ask. So I put that picture in there because everyone knows that Canada's cold, and that's true, it is. So uh, there's this, a fence switch there. You can see it's all hoar frosted up, and that's a, a little nest. And if this thing works, there we go. So in the summer, we do get green up there, believe it or not. And uh, that particular plaque there represents that we've been in business for over 100 years. So I'm kind of proud of that fact. It's a family farm. My grandfather started there just over the 100 years ago now. And the, the fourth generation is taking over, and the fifth one is on the ground. Whether they take over after that, I don't know. But uh, hopefully we've set the seed so it will be possible. Whoops, sorry, going the wrong. I haven't figured this out yet. And there's our humble abode. So in the summer we do get uh, a little bit of green happening in, in Canada too. Um, so I'm going to show you this picture here. Just for those of you that aren't familiar with our geography, this is the province of Alberta, this is the province of Saskatchewan, and this is Manitoba. Plentywood, Montana is right about there. I farm right here, and Minot, North Dakota is about right there. Just to orientate you to roughly where we are in the scheme of things. So this is a moisture map from Agriculture Canada for from April the 1st of this year till last week, I believe it is. And you can see that we're in this purple area right in here, which tells you that we're at the 500 to 550 millimeters of precipitation this year. So for those of you that don't think in millimeters, that is between 20 and 22 inches of rain. We're somewhere in a normal 16 to 18 inch total precip per year. And we've been this way for about 10 years now. We're way above normal. If I go to the next map here, you can see we're down in this blue area again, which says 150 to 200 percent of normal precipitation. So whether this is the new norm, whether this is a freak, I don't know. I have no way of knowing that. Uh, my job as a manager is to, to manage with whatever comes. I have zero control over the weather, so I need to have a system in place that takes in all eventualities. Uh, that's what my goal is, is whether we're in dry or whether we're in wet, we've got we to gotta manage. So the first picture I'm going to show you, and usually I love to show this to ranchers because this is the single most profitable enterprise there is, is chickens. If you figure it out per acre, it's pretty incredible. But I don't know how many of you are familiar with chickens, but when I see chickens coming out of an industrial barn, they don't look like this. They're anemic looking. You notice the feet, see they're bright yellow, the combs are bright red, the, bre the beaks are very bright yellow. If you look at one coming out of an industrial barn, it's extremely anemic. The other thing you'll notice on those chickens is there's no peck marks. There's no stress on those chickens. They aren't all pecked up, you don't see pecking up here on the combs, you don't see pecking here around the back end. They're extremely healthy. So that, that tells me that's a good thing. They're also kind of a pleasant eating experience too. <laughs> but what's interesting to me about raising chickens is we do it with the Salatin style tractors. He calls them chicken tractors. And so it's just an extremely high tech operation. You can see it's a bit of old scrap iron with some old stucco wire welded on there, a little bit of wrecked roofing panel. And we have this high tech mover back here where you just tip, tip this thing over. Those two wheels right there, one on each side, lift up the back end, you come to the front end, pull it ahead 10 feet, and you're done. Dump some more feet for them, and that's it. Pretty simple. So that's how it works. But this is the interesting part. Look at what it did to the land. Every single square inch 
of that land is flattened and fertilized. That's pretty cool. There isn't a cow or sheep made that can do that. So if you're looking at land improvement, this is the way to go, folks. It's incredible what chickens will do. And you start figuring out your stocking rate, you can get a lot of chickens on an acre. In fact, probably 10 or 20 acres will serve all of Montana quite easily. <laughs> so there you can just see later on in the season, you can see how, how the, uh, you know, as the, as the tractors moved ahead every day, you can see how they knock down. You know, this is likely September picture here, late September from the look of the vegetation. And even that stiff alfalfa plants and so on, you can see they've pretty well knocked them down flat. So that, that's pretty cool. And you should see how the grass grows the next year on those spots. So we talked, our earlier speaker, Molly, talked about soil microbiology. I've never tested this, but I would think that the soil microbiology under there would be pretty incredible. So the second thing we do is raise cows. And you can see there was a fence here a few hours ago, a few minutes ago probably. And you can see we left quite a bit behind and those cows look reasonably happy eating grass. One of the things that we try to work on, it's not easy, but we try and get the litter down. We try and, we, I don't really care how much they eat. I'm not very worried about how much they eat. I'm more worried about what, what the feed are doing. Because if I can get my land covered with litter, then the soil microbiology starts to work. So I think one of the things that I've learned over the years is that I'm not, when I first started out, I thought I was a cow farmer. And I should probably step back here and tell you a little bit about my farming history. When I graduated from ag college, I was a high tech guy. You couldn't give me enough technology. I was just gung ho. Every new chemical, every new whatever it was, I was gung ho to try it. And I did that for about 20 odd years. And I finally concluded that I was on a vicious treadmill where I was actually having to go to the farm supply company every year and buying more stuff to grow basically the same crop. And the margins kept getting tighter and tighter and tighter. Plus, probably what was even worse was my soil health was going backwards. I could sense that. I could feel that by looking at the soil, by smelling the soil. And I said, this can't work long term. And so I started seeding the farm back to grass. Now, this was extremely unusual. In fact, it was very much a community service I did in our local coffee shop because everybody was so busy talking about what I was doing, they didn't have time to gossip about the neighbors. <laughs> so anyway, we've always been a little bit different. I guess that's my Norwegian nature, and it doesn't really worry me that particular much. But uh, it, so, so this, this, this is quite unusual at, at that point in time, back 20 odd years ago when we started doing this. But, so over the years then, and I'd never owned a cow up to that point either, so I started seeding grass and getting cows and uh, learning how to chase cows around, and then along came holistic management, and that made a whole lot of light bulbs click on for me. And ever since then, things have slowly gotten better and, and better, and, and a few years ago, we kind of thought we were at the point where we were thinking, well, should we sell the farm or whatever, and we'd sent all our kids away to university to get smarter than I was, and, we didn't think any of them would ever return to agriculture, and lo and behold, one day one of our sons came back and said, uh, Dad, we think we'd like to farm. And so that was kind of good news. I'm not sure my wife is totally convinced that's a good decision yet, but that's what they've done, and they've been with us for the last six or seven years now. And, and uh, his wife is actually Vancouver born and bred, never been on a farm until she came to Red vs. Saskatchewan, and uh, she seems to be fitting in and quite enjoying life in that part of the world. We now have three grandchildren from that particular family, and uh, they're out on the farm quite regularly, so it kind of makes us both pretty, pretty happy when you see these, these little folks out there. I guess I'm getting away from my story here. So one of the keys that, that we work on is we want to get that litter down, we want to get that soil covered. Bare soil is evil, folks. Evil, evil, evil. And I'm just going to spend a minute and talk about bare soil. So i got to do a demonstration here. So if I took something and had a major catastrophic event on this arm, it was burnt or somebody flailed the skin off it or whatever happened, this organism on my arm would likely be in serious problems. I would be losing fluid out. All of the pathogens that are in this room would be able to attack this organism. 
Uh, temperature control would be gone. We all know that when we're, when we're warm, skin makes us wet to cool us. When we're cold, it goosebumps up to keep us warm. If we or get warm, if we get colder, it even starts to vibrate to, to create more energy to keep us warm. So it's a critical organism for my success. We've heard horror stories of people being burnt 30, 40, 50% of their body, and usually they die. So skin is extremely critical to the success of every one of us in this room. Think of litter or armor on the soil exactly the same. If we don't have armor or litter on that soil, it's exactly the same thing. It does a phenomenal role in keeping things healthy. All those microorganisms that are down underneath there won't function properly unless they have litter on top. So, I got a little carried away there. But. So this, this is beauty. This is absolute heaven. When you're done a grazing pass and your soil looks like that, when you stand on top and look straight down, you give yourself a clap on the back, pour yourself a beer and say, great job. <laughs> So here's a, a herd of cows. This is fairly high stock density here. <laughs> that is about 700,000 pounds an acre of stock density. So they were just, just moving right there, getting ready to, uh, to move into the next move. And you may think that's you know, pretty high. This is a, a farmer, just one of my neighbors by the name of Neil Dennis. He's probably one of the higher stock density grazers in the world. And uh, it's really neat to see this in operation. You lift the fence up, you can see just behind here, the fence is actually lifted up. And those cattle just moved into here. And you can see virtually every head is down here except the first few, there was a whole tour of people here. So these cattle right here are actually looking at the people standing there. But virtually every other cow has got its head down and is eating. So this, this is, uh, there was, uh, I think there's about 800 head here and there's about a one acre paddock. So these cattle go in, they will move around the entire paddock eating the grass. In about two hours, they're done, they lay down, and they wait for the next move. When the lifter goes up for the next move, every cow has a crap, moves ahead, does it again. Pretty cool. So this, this is the ultimate in strip grazing, I guess. Now, I'm not advocating that, that we need to get to this high stock density, but I'm just, just showing it as an illustration of, of probably the extreme of high stock density grazing. This is my operation right here, and I can't remember what year this picture was taken, how many cows were here, but you can see fences right along here. There's a fence, right? You can kind of see the line right along there. And uh, so I just use a fairly long, narrow strip there. That group of cows just went in there a few minutes ago and they're basically going to take it down to whatever level I choose to have them take it down to. And then the next day they will move ahead again. We move daily. This particular year we had 155 pair of cattle, cows, cows and calves. And my son runs a flock of, he has 500 ewes. So that's what we're running plus the few chickens that we run. And uh, we have six quarters of land. So to give you an idea of what are, are the number of animals that we have. So there's about 800 sheep and uh, 310 or 20 pair of or head of cattle on six quarters of land. We graze from April and we will probably graze till maybe the first, second week in January, depending on how, how deep the snow gets. Snow always beats us. You guys are very lucky where you are here and that you have open winters and you don't need to worry about funny things like deep snow and hay bales. So just another picture of a different group of cattle, a different year. You can see these, you know, these were uh, seven-way yearlings right here. You can see how tall our grass grows compared to probably what you guys are used to. It's just the function of we're in a different part of the world. We're in a black soil zone, you know, considerably more moisture than you do. But the principles are exactly the same. No matter where you are in the world, the principles are exactly the same. Just another picture, we have little things called sloughs and trees and stuff like that, which is a great advantage in the winter. I don't have to build artificial shelters because the trees do it for me. 
just a group of cows grazing again with a little reflection in the water. My photographic eye just happened to see that one bright morning and thought it was kind of neat. And snow does come even in Canada, believe it or not. And here we are. This is probably a December picture. And uh, the cows are quite content out there grazing. Here we are December 19th in 2014. I don't know how well you can see that picture at the back, but I guess what, what fascinates me is the land begins to heal and get healthy, how things change. And it used to be that I thought about this time of year, all growth was ceased, done. Same thing, no growth happened till May. Now I'm seeing growth in March, and if you can just t tell, this grass is still quite green yet on December the 19th in Canada. So that tells me, there's photosynthesis happening yet. When there's photosynthesis happening, guess what? It's making sugar. It's sending sugar down into those microorganisms under my feet and making them do things too. And we're starting to see now that the land doesn't really freeze solid anymore. It used to be it got like iron by about middle, middle November, first of December. You know, you couldn't do anything with the land. It was froze up tight. Now I can put in step in posts generally through the winter. Because we've got litter on the land, I believe we have more microorganisms working, they create heat underneath there. If we're sending energy down in there, that keeps them happy. So it's a, it's a wonderful, good news story. So I believe that over the last 20 years that we've been doing this, we've probably gained one month of grazing season by just doing things like this. So, winter does come, and so we use the concept of what we call bale grazing. So we, we part bales out, and we let the cattle eat those bales just right out there, wherever it is. We always pick the absolute worst spot on our farm to bale graze, and the reason we pick the worst spot is because basically what we were doing is we're buying the organic matter from our neighbors and bringing it to our farm. That's what we're doing. If the neighbor doesn't appreciate the value of that organic matter, more power to me. You know, like if you look at a true holistic view, that's probably not very wise. My cattle should probably go to his farm. That would be the more logical way of doing that. But you try that on, try that on him, and he looks like you like like where are you from? <laughs> if he wants to get that hay off and get it to my field, so fine, that's what I'll do. I'll take it. <laughs> so just another picture of bale grazing a different year. You can see that we have fairly rolling land, so back through the farming years, the 1930s really destroyed a lot of our farm. The 1980s were bad, there was a huge decade of drought there. We lost more land. If I went out and cultivated that, I don't think it would be that color now, but back in my cultivating days, those hilltops were all white. The A and B horizons of the soil had totally been lost by bad farm. And so that's the reason why we pick those spots to bale graze. There's no point coming down here in the low spot. It's got lots of black soil down there. But up across the top of the hills is where, where we need to rebuild organic matter. Well, I'll just go back one picture. And so, so the cattle, in, in this case right here, this was in my earlier years of bale grazing, before I got dumber. And I had a fence that went along here. I think you can maybe see a post right there. And so I would let the cattle clean up all those bales, and then I would move my wire ahead to the next row of bales, and then let the cattle eat the next row. Now that I'm older and lazier, I just put 50 bales or 100 bales in a paddock, go in there when you're done, I calculate how much feed that is, I know how much my cows eat per day, I go back in 37 days and see how they're doing. That may not be quite true. I usually check a little more often than that. But basically, they will be in there that whatever the number of days is, and I'll move them to the next paddock. So it makes it pretty, pretty simple to winter feed. And so we usually budget to do this for about three months. Traditionally, most farmers in my part of the world feed cattle for five and a half to six months of the winter of the year. I don't like feeding bales. This is the most expensive way of, or most expensive form of, uh, over my entire uh, season, feeding hay, even this cheaply, is still the most expensive part of my operation. If I could eliminate this, I could be way more profitable. But unfortunately, when you get two and a half to three feet of snow, 
in continuous, uh, you know, uh, zero degrees or lower for two weeks on end, you, you can't, you have to have artificial feed. It just won't work here. You can melt condition off cows really fast. I have learned that the hard way. So one of the other little tools that we use is we have, this is wolf willow. Is everyone familiar with wolf willow? You know what that is? No? It's in the Russian, or Russian olive family. I can't remember its last name. I know we call it wolf willow, but it's, it's a brush plant. And we have brush encroachment in our part of the world. Because we are wet, the natural vegetation would like to be trees. My business is grass, so I don't like trees. Or I won't say I don't like trees, I don't want to have all trees. So we use that right there, we just put salt or mineral in there. And you can see how those cows have went in there and they have you know, got in there to get at the salt and they've broken some of these branches off, opened it up. So now we're going to get light down in there and we'll grow more grass. Instead of just having brush, we got grass starting. It's a picture of some of my son's sheep here. I don't have very many sheep pictures in this particular presentation, but we, uh, he, he has about 500 ewes now. And he believes that's more profitable than cattle and he may be 100% correct. So who am I to say what he should be doing? So that's just a little bit about what, what it kind of looks like on a day-to-day -day basis at our particular operation. So I guess the, the, the thing that I want to talk about a bit more is, is why do we do this? And I, and I believe that the reason that I do it is, is I like the word regenerative. I detest the word sustainable. Sustainable. I hear car manufacturers tell me they have sustainable production models. Well, I don't want anything to do with a model like that. So I believe that the word we should be using is regenerative. We need to be building. We're all farming horribly degraded resource called soil. It's been abused for many, many years. I don't think, does anybody here have a farm that's not degraded? I don't see anybody putting their hand up anyway. You know, it's all been degraded badly. In my part of the world, at settlement in 1880, we had 12% organic matter soils. Today, most farms are between two and five. So over that 130, 140 years of farming, we have taken that down from 12% to three, 4%. And so what regenerative farming means to me is we can start to build that back up. And that's what's key. And part of building that up, we're also building up people. If we had all 12% organic matter farms, we don't need 12,000 acre farms to make a living. We could have 12, 1,000 acre farms making a living. And having way more people in the landscape is much better. We have rural communities. We have get-togethers. You know, when, when the farmers are 50 miles apart, it's hard to have a community. And the other thing that isn't that bad to have is profit. It's not a dirty word, it's a good word. And if we are not profitable, folks, we are not in business. So we need to be aware of that. We need to make sure that we are profitable. So that's why I do some of the things the way I do it. So part of this is the holistic management framework. So basically, here's our mission statement, just what I showed you there, that we want to you know, build soils, build people, build profits, things like that. So we have a holistic goal. But what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about right now are this, this next level right here, is these ecosystem processes. The biological community, the water cycle, the mineral cycle, and the capture of energy. I think we need to understand those four things so, so then you can design a farming system that will work. I think that's what we've missed in our industrial approach. We've just went at it with technology to try and get yield, but we haven't understood that very well. So the first thing that we need to really be aware of is solar capture. And when you look straight down at your land, you can see that there's some bare patches right in here. So obviously, it's not a very good solar capture. Go stand under a tree right now and look at the sun, and you will see it perfectly clearly. Go stand under that very same tree in July, and you will not see one single ray of sunshine hitting you. And just look at the engineering of how those branches are put together and how those little leaves come out and how they stand there and they are able to capture every single ray 
of sunlight that hits that area. And so if we don't have solar capture, nothing else will happen. Go lay a piece of plywood on your land for a month and lift it up and see what happened under there. Not one thing happened. And we don't think about that enough. So most people that are cropping up in my part of the world anyway, it's all spring cropping. So they're growing wheat, they're growing canola, they're growing uh, barley, uh, soybeans, all these things. So they, they're planting about mid-May. The crop comes green 10 days later, it emerges, it starts to green up. So that, say the 20th, 25th of May, it starts to green. And by about the end of July or the first week in August, it's ripening. So they basically are capturing solar energy for 70 days of the year. In cold Canada, we have the potential for between 220 to 250 days of solar capture. Basically, from the moment snow leaves till snow arrives, we can capture solar energy. That's the potential. They're capturing it for 70 days. That's not very good. So those other 150 days or whatever it is, there's no energy going down there to feed those bugs that are critical for our success. So what do those bugs do? They die. They got no energy. So we need to think about how we design our agricultural systems to capture energy. Because it's number one, it's free. All we gotta do is capture the sunlight. Miracle of photosynthesis sends the sugar down into the roots. So we gotta think about that. So whether we're grazers, whether we're croppers, whether we're vegetable farmers, it doesn't matter. We need to think about that. How do we do it? And that's why we have such an interest in polycropping, intercropping, all these things, especially in the, in the cropping business. How do we get different crops to grow, you know, after, before, during, whatever, to try and make more solar capture? So Molly talked quite a lot about this, but I'll just spend a couple minutes talking about my simple understanding of it. So up at the top here, we have the sun shining on the, on the green to make photosynthesis and the sugar goes down into those roots and it exudes out and becomes bacteria and fungi food. So that's the beginning of the process. So then we got all these nematodes and protozoas and arthropods and all those other things that are chomping away on the organic matter and the litter. And the net result of all that, the, the, the living and the dying of all that, is organic matter. And that's wonderful. When we start to build organic matter, we are regeneratively farming. So here we have a picture of a, a plant that was dug out and you can see how the aggregation begins to form as you go down these roots. You can see all these little micro aggregates and bigger aggregates that Molly was talking about. And what happens to the soil when that starts to happen is the soil becomes less dense. It loosens. That allows oxygen to enter easier. That allows water to enter easier. So, so this is all exciting stuff. One of the problems we have in most of the land that I see when I drove down here yesterday is we don't have really good water cycles or mineral cycles. This is the picture of a soil microaggregate, micro just an artist rendition and Molly covered all that so I think I'll skip over it. So I'm gonna talk about the water cycle briefly. That's a picture of a raindrop hitting bare soil. And it looks like you threw a hand grenade and so think about a rainstorm, how many raindrops are falling per second? Quite a few. And you've all been out in a hard rainstorm where the rain actually hurts your skin. You actually feel it, it stings. And so you can imagine on bare soil, this isn't really a good thing. And the net result of that happening thousands and thousands of times per second of that rain hitting the soil, for every force there's an equal and opposite reaction, so the water's, whoop, whoop. That's what happens. <laughs> It springs back up and the soil comes back up too. And the net result of that is that that soil becomes impervious as the top of this table. The water will not, it becomes like plasticine. And the water will not go down. And I'm sure you've all seen, after a hard rain, you've seen water puddling. Maybe even a half inch, a quick little shower. You'll see water puddling. It's not going down. That's what's happening because it's hitting bare soil. So if you have a litter layer on there, you solve the problem. Remember that skin thing? You put litter on top, it's just like a sponge. There's no, none of this happening then with the litter layer. 
So on our farm, one of the goals is to capture every single raindrop right where it falls. I don't want it to run down the hill. I want it to go in wherever it happened to fall. I have zero control about when it comes, how much, but I want it to go in. So here's what happens when the water cycle isn't particularly efficient. And you have massive devastation. I'm talking with Steve last night, he was telling me just north of here a ways, he, there's been tremendous amounts of rain in northern Montana. This was taken in 11 where I live. We had tremendous amounts of rain in June. And you can see the kind of devastation. This, this one right here is a railway bridge, or it was a railway, it was culvert through there. And you can see how the, that's the railway, the steel is still hanging there, but I don't think you'd want to run a train on that anymore. But it, you know, it's incredible. This is actually the lane into my farm right down here. If you came to visit me today, you would wonder how there could ever be water there. It, could, it just seems impossible that there could be water there, and yet it was there. And it's because the water cycle is not functioning. Most of the floods that happen anywhere in the world are a large, largely as a result of our agricultural practices of having bare land. If we had litter on every single acre, we would solve it. So that's how we solve it, right there. On this side right here, we have some bare land, that water will run, plus we're losing moisture on a, on, in, a, in a drier year. We're getting evaporation. You can see the cracking in the land. On this side right here, that's not gonna happen. And if you wanna do some temperature testing, right here on a nice warm day, this soil will be much cooler than the air temperature. On a nice cool day, this soil will be much warmer than the air temperature. Right here, on a cool day, it will actually be colder, and on a hot day, it will be way warmer. Bacteria like that? No, they don't. They like a blanket on. So, the last one I want to talk about, I've talked about solar capture, the mineral cycle, the water cycle. The last thing is diversity. As soon as we talk about diversity, we automatically think about what are we growing. Diversity is way bigger than that. Diversity is what's around, what's up in the air, what bugs there is, what kind of people are on the land, what kind of animals are on the land. All those things are diversity. So one of the things that, that we do in our farm is we encourage you know, tree swallows and bluebirds to live there. And what all they do, I'm not, I can't really tell you, but I know it's good. We even have moose on our farm. You can see two calves right there. That moose looks like she's doing pretty darn good. So that's it's kind of a nice thing to see. It's a symptom of advanced succession when you see moose running around, or elk, or any of those type of animals. And here we have a little 13-line ground squirrel working in there. He's pretty happy too with that kind of litter and, and forage cover on top. And the fourth one then, or the, the, the other example of diversity, is, is these are all native plants, and you can see the different types of rooting systems. Now each one of these has a different group of bugs that live in association with those roots. So if I have a cow coming along, and she's a little short of zinc, she's pretty sharp, that cow. She knows what she needs. If she has a choice, she may know that, hey, this plant right here is high in zinc, so she'll come along and take a bite of that particular plant. Solve her zinc problem. Maybe in a week she needs a little copper. Maybe it's this one right here is good at bringing copper up. So she'll take a bite of that one. And if the animals have a choice, it's been proven scientifically that they will always balance their diet. Where we run into issues in our modern agriculture is we put monoculture in there and then we have to run to town and buy artificial mineral supplements. So get diversity. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. So here just a shot of some bale grazing. Again, the litter, that's the same picture in May 27th. You can see how that starting. You see the green coming through. We've done some measurements, and on these spots, the first time I did this, I thought, oh my God, I've killed my land. I've killed everything. So I went out like a good grain farmer and harrowed it all. That was the stupidest thing I'd ever done. So don't ever harrow. Just leave it. It'll, it's just amazing. And on this site right here, we have 800% increase in grass production here versus here two years later, 800%. Zero inputs. So here's brush encroachment. So over the last 80 years or 90 years, my grandfather and my father, this was set stock grazed, continuous grazed, 
And we have patches of brush like this, no respecting cow, she has a choice, will ever walk into that. So if we have a species here that has no stress, what? guess what, it becomes more dominant. All around it we had grass which was continuously eaten off, so it was stressed, so guess what happened? The brush expanded. Pretty soon then the aspen trees expanded and we were becoming a solid forest. So once I realized that, my holistic management training said, oh, okay, we can change that. So we put, using high stock density, you can see where the fence was, the brush patch was just as thick on this side. So by using high stock density, we're changing it. I don't want to get rid of all my trees. I actually don't mind a little bit of brush, but my business is grass. And so some days you don't think you're doing much. This is seven years since, I, since that fence was built. It was exactly the same on both sides, the amount of brush. And you can see how the hoof action of the cows thinned out that brush. So here's just a little comparison shot. Traditionally we have 25 cows set stocked on a quarter section is the traditional grazing method used in my part of the world. Here we have this side. So 15 day, or May 15, 63 days when that picture is taken and I want you to look at those nice knees and rubber boots. <laughs> and then look at the nice knees and rubber boots on this one. So here we're 98 days, this is adjacent quarters, right next door to each other, same rainfall, same day, same everything, no, no uh, photo swapping or any of this fancy high tech stuff, just real pictures. You can see the rubber boots there. Which cows do you think are happier? And you should see it two months later. So, one of the things that I get quite passionate about is carbon, and sequestration. So I've been monitoring carbon in our part of the world for a few years. So in 11 we had 221 tons, in 214 we had 239, so we gained 6.19 tons of carbon per hectare per year. And if you convert that to CO2, that's 22.8 tons of carbon per hectare. The Canadian, each Canadian puts out 18.9, you guys are a wee bit better, I believe your footprint's 19.8 tons per person per year. It's your carbon footprint from driving, cooking, all those things. So every single hectare that I operate more than sequesters one of your carbon footprint. Isn't that pretty cool? Yeah, and these are done with these evil methane belching cows. <laughs> so how we do it, we take a four meter square spot, we take plot, 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 all the squares are or the circles are taken out in year one. Three or four or five years later, we go back to that exact, the exact same site, we take out the next set of probes, send them to a lab, they're analyzed for carbon, and that's how you get your number. We have it this high in year one, we have it this high year in year four later. Do the subtraction, that tells you how much carbon you sequester. It's a pretty simple calculation. So here we just have a little picture of a plug. Environmentalists tell me that cattle are evil, so you shouldn't do anything to the land, you should just let it be. So here we have very similar pieces of land dug out on the same day. Here you can see rested land. Look at the litter sitting there. It's way up high, it's not decomposing, it's oxidizing. Here we have a plan graze lots of animals for a short time. I don't think it takes too much of a rocket scientist to see which one is better. So just a wee bit, maybe I'll just skip this, this is just a little bit of stuff. So here's some numbers from our farm, just the ADAs harvested and you can see it jumps up and down a little bit, part, partly uh, the number of, uh, it has a function to do with animals and moisture, but generally it's, it's, it's moving up. And so when we harvest more ADAs, that's more pocket change in Blaine's pocket. So the last couple of pictures here are some pictures of photosynthetic capacity. So this is my home section of land right here. This is the neighboring township in red around. And this is a, a compilation of all of the 2010 data from Landsat photography. So when you put it on a bar graph that we can understand better, you can see that that blue section every single year captured way more solar energy than the neighbors did by a considerable amount in many years. So what does that mean? That means that we're growing more. Our land is getting better. We're sequestering more carbon than the neighbors are. That's pretty cool, I think. So here's some results from, from southeastern Saskatchewan. So these are just the various farmers that we've been testing. And you can see the average here is 27.8 tons per, of carbon, carbon dioxide per hectare per year is the average. Now in Canada, we're going to have a carbon tax fairly shortly. And the, the chatting is about $20 a ton 
is what the tax will be. So at a $20 a ton tax, if governments collected that money from those that are burning gasoline and propane and natural gas and all those things, and they let it flow back to those of us that would sequester, it works out to $34,000 per quarter section per year at the rate of that sequestration. We're talking significant money, ecological goods and services that we do as society, or as farmers for society for absolute free. And I believe it's time we get rewarded for that. I think it's critical that we do that. We know that we have way too much carbon up here. We don't have enough carbon under our feet. And if we want to change behavior of society, I believe this is one of the fastest ways to do it. You tax those that buy the product, you reward those that take it back out. And every bit of our land can use more carbon in it. So thank you very much. I think I'm out of time. Is that correct? You have a couple minutes. A couple minutes? Okay. If anybody has a quick question, I will. Oh. I guess I forgot my last slide. This picture was taken, last year was the International Year of the Soils. The United Nations rec recognized the criticalness of soil health. This picture was taken, or this, this was sowed to grass about 15 years ago, and it was totally white like this right to the top. It had been totally degraded by agriculture. And you can see here, this is 13 inches I think right there, and you can see how that carbon in about 18 years is down to 13 inches already. So it's remarkable how fast we can turn it around. You know, I was taught in school it takes 1,000 years or 2,000 years to make an inch of soil. That's a bunch of crap. We can build soil relatively rapidly. So it's exciting, folks. This is regenerative agriculture is the way to go. So it just is so good to see people like you out here today to, uh, to learn and share. And, and uh, we all, all can learn from each other. So thank you very much.